This book is called Poetry for Young People, Carl Sandberg. It was edited, and edited here means that this woman helped picked out the poems for this particular book. It was edited by Francis Schoonmaker Bowen, and the beautiful illustrations were drawn by the artist Stephen Arcello. Carl Sandberg tries to paint pictures with his words. Stephen Arcello painted the pictures with his brushes. If your name's Timothy and you live in Chicago, you probably already know that Carl Sandburg is very famous for being a poet from Chicago who wrote about Chicago and who loved Chicago. But he also was somebody who lived for 17 years in the state of Michigan. And if you're from Benton Harbor or St. Joe's or Coloma or New Buffalo, that's where Carl Sandburg lived in Berrien County, right on Lake Michigan, and he loved living there. It was only when his health um, wasn't very good and he needed to live somewhere warmer that he moved to North Carolina. But it's easy to find some information about him uh, being in Michigan, and that's a picture of his little office there in Berrien County, Michigan. The first poem is called Fog. The fog comes on little cat feet. It sits looking over harbor and city on silent haunches and then moves on. Second poem is called From the Shore. A lone gray bird, dim dipping, far flying, alone in the shadows and grandeurs and tumults of night and the sea and the stars and the storms. Out over the darkness it wavers and hovers. Out into the gloom it swings and batters. Out into the wind and the rain and the vast. Out into the pit of a great black world where fogs are at battle. Sky-driven, sea-blown, love of mist and rapture of flight, glories of chance and hazards of death, on its eager and palpitant wings, out into the deep of the great dark world, beyond the long borders where foam and drift of the sundering waves are lost and gone, on the tides that plunger and rear, and crumble. And because painters sometimes use fancy colors like cadmium yellow and cobalt blue, poets sometimes use fancy words that we don't hear very often. And poetry is meant to be read out loud, and it's meant to be read more than once. Uh, so for this one poem, let's read it more than once. We'll just read the other ones once, and you can go back over them if you find you love or one or more of these poems. But sometimes it helps to read a poem twice. So, from the shore. A lone gray bird, dim dipping, far flying, alone in the shadows and grandeurs and tumults of night and the sea and the stars and storms. Out over the darkness it wavers and hovers. Out into the gloom it swings and batters out into the wind and the rain and the vast, out into the pit of a great black world, where fogs are at battle, sky-driven, sea-blown, love of mist and rapture of flight, glories of chance and hazards of death on its eager and palpitant wings. Out into the deep of the great dark world, Beyond the long borders where foam and drift of the sundering waves are lost and gone on the tides that plunger and rear and crumble. This poem is called Young Sea. The sea is never still. It pounds on the shore, restless as a young heart, hunting. The sea speaks and only the stormy hearts know what it says. 
It is the face of a rough mother speaking. The sea is young. One storm cleans all the whore and loosens the age of it. I hear it laughing, reckless. They love the sea, men who ride on it, and know they will die under the salt of it. Let only the young come, says the sea. Let them kiss my face and hear me. I am the last word, and I tell where storms and stars come from. The poem on the left of the page here is called Last Answers. I wrote a poem on the mist, and a woman asked me what I meant by it. I had thought till then only of the beauty of the mist, how pearl and gray of it mix and reel, and change the drab shanties with lighted lamps at evening into points of mystery quivering with color. I answered, the whole world was missed once long ago, and some day it will all go back to mist. Our skulls and lungs are more water than bone and tissue, and all poets love dust and mist because all the last answers go running back to dust and mist. The poem on the right is about that famous gigantic structure, statue, um, in the deserts of Egypt. It's called a sphinx. Close-mouthed, you sat five thousand years and never let out a whisper. Processions came by, marchers, asking questions you answered with gray eyes never blinking, shut lips never talking. Not one croak of anything you know has come from your cat crouch of ages. I am one of those who know all you know, and I keep my questions. I know the answers you hold. Little girl, be careful what you say. Little girl, be careful what you say when you make talk with words, words, for words are made of syllables, and are made of air, and air is so thin. Air is the breath of God. Air is finer than fire or mist, finer than water or moonlight, finer than spider webs in the moon, finer than water flowers in the morning. And words are strong, too, stronger than rocks or steel, stronger than horn fish, cattle, and soft, too, soft as little pigeon eggs, soft as the music of hummingbird wings. So, little girl, when you speak greetings, when you tell jokes, make wishes or prayers, be careful, be careless, be careful what you wish to be. second poem is a portrait poem called Margaret. Many birds and the beatings of wings make a flinging reckless hum in the early morning at the rocks above the blue pool where the gray shadows swim lazy. In your blue eyes, O oh reckless child, I saw today many little wild wishes, eager as the great morning. Some of you can make numbers dance in your head, and when you look at the world, you're always thinking of an equation. This poem might just be for you. It's called Arithmetic. Arithmetic is where numbers fly like pigeons in and out of your head. Arithmetic tells you how many you lose or win if you know how many you had before you lost or won. Arithmetic is seven eleven. all good children go to heaven, or five, six bundle of sticks. Arithmetic is numbers you squeeze from your head to your hand, to your pencil, to your paper, till you get the answer. Arithmetic is where the answer is right and everything is nice, 
and you can look out of the window and see the blue sky. Or the answer is wrong and you have to start all over and try again and see how it comes out this time. If you take a number and double it and double it again and then double it a few more times, the number gets bigger and bigger and goes higher and higher. And only arithmetic can tell you what the number is when you decide to quit doubling. Arithmetic is where you have to multiply and you carry the multiplication table in your head and hope you won't lose it. If you have two animal crackers, one good and one bad, and you eat one, and a striped zebra with streaks all over him eats the other, how many animal crackers will you have if somebody offers you five, six, seven, and you say no, 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 and you say nay, 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 and you say nix, nix, nix? If you ask your mother for one fried egg for breakfast, and she gives you two fried eggs, and you eat both of them, who is better at arithmetic? You or your mother. The poem on the left is called Plowboy. After the last red sunset glimmer, black on the line of a low hill rise formed into moving shadows, I saw a plowboy and two horses lined against the gray, plowing in the dusk the last furrow the turf had a gleam of brown and smell of soil where, and, cool and moist, a haze of April. I shall remember you long, plowboy and horses against the sky and shadow. I shall remember you and the picture you made for me, turning the turf in the dusk and haze of an April gloaming. The title of a poem is like a doorway that lets you open it and walk inside the poem. And Carl Sandburg's poem, used in this next poem, is a good one for us to think about for a second. Because it, it is an example of how words are used to mean as much as they can mean. If you think about sound, there are tones, and a single tone making one sound could be called a monotone. But if you think about the colors that an artist uses when she or he is painting, we talk about a monotone for shades of paint as well. And even just the way somebody talks, if they always sound the same way, we say that that's a monotone. So monotone is the title of this next poem. The monotone of the rain is beautiful, and the sudden rise and slow relapse of the long, multitudinous rain. The sun on the hills is beautiful, or a captured sunset sea flung, bannered with fire and gold. A face I know is beautiful, with fire and gold of sky and sea, and the peace of a long, warm rain. Fizog is a fancy slang word for face, and that's the title of this next poem, Fizog. This face you got, this here Fizog you carry around, you never picked it out for yourself at all, at all, did you? This here Fizog, somebody handed it to you, am I right? Somebody said, here's yours, now go see what you can do with it. Somebody slipped it to you and it was like a package marked no goods exchanged after being taken away. This face you've got. The next poem is called Mask. Fling your red scarf faster and faster, dancer. It is summer and the sun loves a million green leaves, masses of green. Your red scarf flashes across them, calling and a-calling. The silk and flare of it is a great soprano's leading a chorus, carried along in a rouse of voices, reaching for the heart of the world. Your toes are singing to meet the song of your arms. Let the red scarf go swifter. Summer and the sun command you. 
three poems in a row that try to describe and comment on the natural world. Summer grass. Summer grass aches and whispers. It wants something. It calls and sings. It pours out wishes to the overhead stars. The rain hears. The rain answers. The rain is slow coming. The rain wets the face of the grass. Now a poem called Summer Stars. Bend low again, night of summer stars. So near you are, sky of summer stars. So near, and a long-armed man can pick off stars, pick off what he wants in the sky bowl. So near you are, summer stars. So near, strumming, strumming. So lazy and hum-strumming. <clears throat> And the third poem is on the next page. Also a poem about nature called Sky Talk. Wool white horses and their heads sag and roll. Snow white sheep and their tails drag far. Impossible animals ever more impossible. They walk on the sky to say, how do you do? Or goodbye. Or Back soon, maybe. Or would you say any white flowers come more lovely than certain white clouds? Or would you say any tall mountains beckon, rise, and beckon beyond certain tall walking clouds? Is there any roll of white seahorses equal to the sky horse, white, of certain clouds rolling? Now, we may summon buyers and sellers and tell them to go buy certain clouds today, go sell other clouds tomorrow, and we may hear them report ups and downs, brisk buying, brisk selling, market unsteady, never so many fluctuations. Can there be any veering white fluctuations, any moving incalculable fluctuations, quite so incalculable? as certain clouds. More talk about nature and the illustration from the front of the book used here with this poem. October Paint Flame blue wisps in the west. Wrap yourselves in these leaves and speak to winter about us. Tell winter the whole story. Red leaves up the oaken slabs you came little and green spats four months ago. Your climbers put scroll after scroll around the oaken slabs. Red, come red. Some one with an October paint pot said, and here you are. Fifty red arrowheads of leaf paint, or fifty mystic fox footprints, or fifty pointed thumbprints. Hold on. The winds are to come, blowing, blowing. The gray slabs will lose you. The winds will flick you away in a whiff, one by one, two by two. Yet, I have heard a rumor whispered. Tattlers tell it to each other like a secret everybody knows. Next year, you will come again. Up the oaken slabs, you will put your pointed fox footprints green in the early summer, and you will be red at rowheads in the fall time. Tattlers slip this into each other's ears like a secret everybody knows. If I see someone with an October paint pot, I shall be full of respect and say, I saw your thumbprints everywhere. How do you do it? A poem to remember when Halloween comes round. Theme in yellow. I spot the hills with yellow balls in autumn. I light the prairie cornfields, orange and tawny gold clusters, and I am called pumpkins. On the last of October, when dusk is fallen, children join hands and circle round me, singing ghost songs and love to the harvest moon. I am 
a jack-o'-lantern with terrible teeth, and the children know I am fooling. In the first of two poems about a specific animal, this one, Rat Riddles. There was a gray rat looked at me with green eyes out of a rat hole. Hello, rat, I said. Is there any chance for me to get on to the language of the rats? And the green eyes blinked at me, blinked from a gray rat's rat hole. Come again, I said. Slip me a couple of riddles. There must be riddles among the rats. And the green eyes blinked at me, and a whisper came from the gray rat hole. Who do you think you are? And why is a rat? Where did you sleep last night? And why do you sneeze on Tuesdays? And why is the grave of a rat no deeper than the grave of a man? And the tail of a green-eyed rat whipped and was gone at the gray rat hole. In North America, we have many crows and ravens and daws and um, red-winged blackbirds. This is for one of those birds, a homely winter idol. Great, long, lean clouds in sullen host along the skyline passed today, while overhead I've only seen a leaden sky the whole day long. My heart would gloomily have mused had I not seen those queer old crows stop short in their mad frolicking and pose for me in long black rows. Another title here where Sandberg tells us he's painting with words, best he can anyway, the same way a painter paints with colors. Landscape. See the trees lean to the wind's way of learning. See the dirt of the hills shape to the water's way of learning. See the lift of it all go the way the biggest wind and the strongest water want it. Boxes and Bags The bigger the box, the more it holds. Empty boxes hold the same as empty heads. Enough small empty boxes thrown into a big empty box fill it full. A half-empty box says, put more in. A big enough box could hold the world. Elephants need big boxes to hold a dozen elephant handkerchiefs. Fleas fold little handkerchiefs and fix them nice and neat in flea handkerchief boxes. Bags lean against each other, and boxes stand independent. Boxes are square with corners, unless round with circles. Box can be piled on box till the whole works comes tumbling. Pile box on box, and the bottom box says, If you will kindly take notice, you will see it all rests on me. Pile box on box, and the top one says, Who falls farthest, if or when we fall, I ask you. Box people go looking for boxes, and bag people go looking for bags. Carl Sandburg, in addition to the poetry for young people, also wrote a famous group of stories called the Rutabaga Stories, and they're little tales and uh, short stories um, that are for children. This is a picture of Carl Sandburg late in his life reading to two little children. Here's an example of the many other books you can find to explore the works of other American poets. Emily Dickinson from New England is certainly a famous and much-loved American poet. There's a book of her poetry just for children with special illustrations. Famous American poets like Naomi Shihab Nye, um, poets like Langston Hughes. Uh, there's so many American poets who wrote poems that can be read by children. And uh, all you have to do is look. They're easy to find. This has been Poetry for Young People. Author was Carl Sandburg, The editor who helped choose the poems and put them in the order that you read them here was Francis Schoonmaker Bolin. And the artist who did the illustrations was Stephen Arcella.